Welcome to episode 82 of the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I have an update for you on a developing story. This has nothing to do with our episode of the day, so apologies to my guest for material that is technically irrelevant, but I think that even she will find it um, interesting and possibly necessary. So if, like me, you Google things Byzantine uh, on a fairly regular basis uh, or not, you might actually come across a weird technical sense in the area of computer programming and computer science where Byzantine is used to characterize certain kinds of computer systems. I never knew exactly what was going on there because I just skipped past those results because they obviously weren't relevant to whatever I was looking for at the moment. Well, it turns out that in that field, the term Byzantine has been used uh, since 1982 to refer to computer systems that are not only deviant but malicious, like have some deceitful intent, um, destructive purpose, or something along those lines. Now, the professional organization that oversees general standards in that field and quite a number of its publications is called the Association for Computing Machinery. (laughs) The terminology might seem a little bit outdated. It's, I think, from the 40s. Um, Anyway, and they recently launched an initiative called Words Matter, uh, which is to propose alternatives for what they call charged terminology in the computing profession. Uh, Because as you can imagine, you know, Human beings, what they are, a whole bunch of very, very inappropriate terms um, had somehow gotten ensconced in that field, in its technical terminology, uh, to refer to computer systems which, you know, are not generally supposed to behave as human beings. And so on the website of the Words Matter initiative, they put up some of the terms that they are retiring, uh, including terms like um, abort, terminate, uh, terminate child process, a whole lot of black and white language, which gets cringy at some point. Um, daughter, board, dummy, head, gender, bender, master, slave. Uh, that one you generally want to avoid. Anyway, so a colleague in that field also proposed the term Byzantine as being sort of patently offensive in the way in which it was used. Uh, provided a great deal of evidence that it was, in fact, being used in that way uh, to refer to to malice in computer systems, but in a way that clearly violated the guidelines for avoiding culturally insensitive terminology. And the petition was rejected. Uh, It went through the uh, portal for submissions on the Words Matter website, and they wrote back. The committee decided, took a vote, and said, no, Byzantines are all dead, nobody cares, something like that. Uh, He wrote to me, uh, I then wrote to them, and I wrote to the committee specifically. I also wrote to um, our international and national organizations, the Byzantine Studies Association of North America and the International Congress, um, and explained, you know, why this use of the term is really inappropriate. You know, it's not only the meaning of Byzantine that is something excessively con complicated or convoluted, which is a meaning that has only really been in use for 80 years. It's very recent. No, no, this reaches back to medieval times, right, when Western Europeans would call the Greeks, you know, treacherous and unreliable and deviant and, you know, effeminate and, you know, all of that. So we had some back and forth with the committee, and though I haven't heard back from them officially, it does appear that they intend to retire this term. So Byzantine now appears on the list of words that are best avoided. They propose some alternatives, um, including interactive consistency failure and source incongruency. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I'm, since I'm not a computer programmer, I don't know exactly what, what kinds of systems they're talking about. Um, anyway... So in the original version of this introduction, I was going to ask all of you to go to that portal and submit a comment 
about how this term shouldn't be used this way. The portal only allows 50 words, um, so I would have asked you to keep it brief. But it seems that they've already taken the right first step. Um, we'll see if this is going to be enforced. I imagine that they've also heard from plenty of other people, not just me. I'm just giving you my sort of experience of this whole development, uh, which is obviously a very partial one. Uh, but I will keep you informed. Uh, so if there is need for mass mobilization, I will call on you to submit a comment. But for now, it seems that things are going in the right direction. I only saw that this morning, so I had to uh, revise my comments um, uh, for this introduction. So hopefully from now on, when you conduct an internet search for the terms Byzantine generals, you're not going to get a whole bunch of computer science because, yes, that is what comes up. Okay, now on to our topic of the day. So our topic of the day is iconoclasm, and specifically the first period of iconoclasm, which we sometimes call first iconoclasm. There were two periods, first and second. So some background. When I was in grad school, Byzantine iconoclasm was not only a period of Byzantine history, so 8th, early 9th centuries. It was also presumed to be the main cultural, religious, theological, possibly also societal preoccupation of that time. This was the era of Byzantine iconoclasm where the they went back and forth for and against the, the use of icons in religious worship. Well, now that narrative is pretty much gone, and it is in shambles, especially for first iconoclasm. Uh, I'm going to give you my experience of it. So in writing my new history of Byzantium, which I'm now in the final stages of editing, I made sure to pay attention to which theological controversies or religious disputes in Byzantine history elicited a great deal of of social attention. That is, large numbers of people who are invested in the controversy one way or another and who made their feelings known, usually by, you know, protesting, uh, you know, whether violently or not, getting involved in the course of the conflict. I found a total of three such issues. The so-called Arian controversy of the fourth century, the nature's controversy of the fifth, sixth, mostly centuries. It continued afterwards in a way, but the two parts had been separated by the Islamic conquests. And the debate over union with the Church of Rome in the last centuries um, of the existence of the Byzantine Empire. Those were the issues that, as far as I can tell, aroused popular passions. In Especially natures and union. The Arian controversy... It, it, it did get some crowds in the streets, but I think they were fairly small ones because remember the empire at that point in the 4th century wasn't even really Christianized to begin with. So these are small Christian groups, but they were invested in it. And then there are a number of theological controversies that as far as I can tell were limited to very small circles of either ecclesiastical, a few monastic groups, uh, and the court with almost no or no outside interest, like in society at large, no one was paying attention to or cared about what these churchmen and, you know, palace figures were talking about um, or disputing over. And these include iconoclasm, hesychasm in the 14th century, and, some, and many others, I even found one theological controversy that is sometimes played up as a major thing in history books that seemed to have been entirely in the mind of one person. That was in the 7th century, monothelitism, but let's set that aside for now. So yeah, iconoclasm. It's very difficult, and for first iconoclasm, almost impossible to find evidence that anyone outside of a circle of, I don't know, a couple dozen, maybe three dozen people cared about this issue. We also know that the armies of the period didn't take sides in this controversy, didn't really care. There's one group of soldiers, uh, maybe a couple dozen people, um, in, in one episode before the Council of Nicaea II. That's it. Most of the bishops went along with imperial policy, whatever it happened to be. 
Yeah, so really small numbers of people. More importantly, during the past generation, a great deal of careful scholarship, a lot of it philological, has shown that many of the episodes of first iconoclasm, especially the more sort of violent and colorful dramatic stories, were made up later. They appear in texts that have lots of fabricated and fictional elements, can't be trusted at all. In some cases, we can see the process of the accumulation of motifs over time as first iconoclasm just started to get populated with things like martyrs and persecutions and things like that. That almost certainly never happened, at least certainly not in the form in which they're reported. So there's no doubt now that a great deal of what we thought of as first iconoclasm was a later invention, an invention of the early 9th century, and not always based on events of the 8th. Now, you might say, where there's smoke, there's fire. Something must have happened to even create the need to produce a narrative of first iconoclasm. And yes, there was some kind of debate going on about icons, uh, but I will counter that image with another one that where there's smoke in history, there's sometimes a smoke-making machine, and we are now in a position to know who was creating all of that smoke. Now, some of the best work um, in this past generation of scholarship on iconoclasm has been done by my guest today, uh, Leslie Brubaker, the University of Birmingham, who also happens to be one of the very best Byzantine art historians that we have. And she has synthesized her findings and the, and the findings of others. This is a big collaborative effort um, in a very accessible book called Inventing Byzantine Iconoclasm, which I strongly recommend for those who want an introduction to the state of the problem right now. In addition to a massive tome, much more sort of detailed and comprehensive in its coverage of the period, co-authored with John Halden called Byzantium in the Iconoclast Era, this is a Cambridge book from about 10 years ago with some 900 pages. Now, because the period and the arguments about it have a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of complexity here, I decided to focus on first iconoclasm. This is the concern about icons, whatever that was, uh, expressed by mainly two emperors, Leo III and his son Constantine V so-called Isaurian emperors of the 8th century, who were very successful and capable emperors in other respects, but because subsequent history was written by the iconophiles, those who were pro-icon, and they believed that um, Leo and Constantine were very anti-icon to the point of persecuting them, uh, they have for a long time went down with very, very negative reputations um, in Byzantine historiography. Uh, which have been, they have been rehabilitated in the meantime, insofar as their sort of secular careers are, are concerned. The question of icons is still, and still in some ways kind of open, like what exactly were they getting at? What was the problem? Um, and, and how did the controversy play out historically rather than in the sometimes hysterical texts that were left afterwards by the iconophiles? Anyway, I, I hope I haven't given away too much of the argument here, uh, but it is a complicated uh, problem, and so, you know, just quick initial summary I thought was necessary. Here, then, is the really fun conversation I had with Byzantine iconoclasm with the great Leslie Brubaker. Leslie, welcome to the podcast. It's good to see you again. And it's great to see you, too. So I remember when I was a graduate student, and just working my way through all phases of Byzantine history. So let's say this is like mid nineties. There was so little to read on iconoclasm. Like the, even by then the scholarship was very old. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there were things from the thirties that were still like, this is the latest work on something, right? And now that picture is completely transformed, fortunately. So now mm -hmm. we have a lot of good stuff and you're at the center of a lot of it. So, um, you did a lot of work on iconoclasm for a while, maybe like folk, maybe 10 years ago might have been the, the sort of peak of your um, interest in that. And maybe you've moved on. <laughs> I'm dragging you back into that, but it, it is a very important topic. And I think people have a lot of questions about what it was. And so I thought, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's 
um, you should tell them directly um, what you found. Um, so why don't we start with the traditional narrative? Um, and then we can complicate it or, or toss it out, whatever. But what were the main components of the narrative of Byzantine iconoclasm if, if you were looking at it again, like let's say in the 90s or before you got interested in it? Oh my, I think probably, well, everybody argued. The, the big argument at that point was, did it start in 726 or 730? You remember that one? It yes, was like, yes. well, what was it? And it was all about, was it the big earthquake or was it the eruption of Santorini? What caused Leo III to decide that God hated the Byzantines and they needed to do something very quickly to appease his wrath? So he banned icons. That's what, but so whether it was 726 or 730, people were like screaming and yelling about that. So that was, but it started then, and it was Leo III saying, we're not going to do icons anymore. Get rid of them, destroy them all. We now know, of course, that that's probably not true, but never mind. That's what people thought. Then everybody went trotting along happily until 787, roughly, when the good Empress Irene, everybody at this point conveniently forgot that her son, Constantine VI, was actually co-ruling with her and was, anyway, um, decided, never mind, we're put, bringing icons back. Everybody then trotted along happily with icons again until 815, when the emperor was losing battles, reinstated iconoclasm, and then everybody trotted along happily with that until 843, when once again, a female empress, Theodora, who was regent for Michael III, um, said, no, 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 we will now have icons again. And then everybody lived happily ever after. That was the kind of core narrative. Yeah. Why it happened then, why it happened that way, nobody had asked. It was very weird. So that's why I got interested in it. And iconoclasm was understood as a sort of systematic, rational, linear destruction of icons, get rid of them, right? Like people weren't quite that black and white about okay. it. Okay. But nobody really questioned it. You know, you know what history was like in, yes. in the good old days. It was just kind of, well, this is it was narrative. Nobody nuanced it. No, you know, it was just like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Yeah. So there was not a lot of that. But yeah, basically, all, that's why we have nothing left from the pre-iconoclast period because it was all destroyed and blah, blah, blah. And that's why there was such a flowering after iconoclasm because everybody was so relieved to be able to draw pictures again kind of thing. Yeah. And it was also kind of understood that that the monks were like the orthodox resistance. Oh my God, yes. Right. And that the emperors were the iconoclast emperors were persecutors. And so it kind of brought back the whole narrative of the early persecutions, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That is yeah. totally right. Okay. So we won't go into the deeper substrata, which and and here it gets kind of dark because we're getting back to like the 30s and stuff like that, but where Iconoclasm is a Semitic, Eastern, oh, right? Kind of yeah. anti-image, whereas the iconophiles are more, the more Hellenic, Western, Hellenic. like, let's not get into that. The enlightened, we're almost American democracy. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, that's exactly. Okay, so yeah, that was already gone by that point. Anyway, okay. Well, so it, that still lingers on very, very faintly in some of the more um, questionable literature. <laughs> I think we could say, but yeah, it's it does. Yeah, I sometimes encounter it in like for, from a Greek nationalist point of view, but that's yeah, whole, that's... it's kind of odd, isn't it? But yeah. but not very often, and it's mostly graduate students. By the time they've kind of worked oh. their way through, they're happier, except for one or two. But, yeah. Okay, um, so let's talk about some of the the building blocks of the the whole controversy. So, what are icons exactly in this controversy? Oh. In modern parlance, icons in this controversy are panel paintings, normally. Of course, to the Byzantines, icon just means image. So it's not, it could be on a wall, it could be in a manuscript, it could be whatever. But in the context of iconoclasm, or what we now call iconoclasm, what was particularly at the center of discussion was sacred portraiture. 
and not narrative sacred portraiture, but basically like a screenshot of our heads, like we're seeing on the screen right now, you know, kind of the head of a saint, right. um, sometimes a full figure, but, but particularly in the early period, mostly just a, you know, a, a head shot sort of a thing. So a, a, a sacred portrait, basically, and largely in the in the what the Byzantines talked about was mostly portraits of Christ, also some Mary, some the saints, but mostly Christ. But that's a distinction that was largely lost in the in the secondary literature and the literature of people writing about it. Right. So just to be clear, we're not talking about like secular art, right? Images of emperors and all that. We're not talking about the hundreds of statues of nude gods and ancient heroes that were all over the place. Like those are kind of irrelevant. Yeah, I think they were basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what does iconoclasm mean? And was this the term that was used at the time? And if not, what terms were used? It wasn't the term that was used at the time. Iconoclasm is a made up word. It was made up in the 16th century. And it's icon image, clasm break, it's breaking images. It was made up during the Reformation, of the Protestant Reformation, ah. obviously, as a way of kind of legitimizing what they were doing. They give it, you know, Greek antecedents, make it Hellenic. Um, what the Byzantines called, they, the, the Byzantines had the term iconoclast, an image breaker, but it was never used in a positive sense. It was always a pejorative. And the term, as far as, I mean, I have never seen it used in a positive sense anyway. And mm. I, if you have, let me know, please. Mm. Um, nobody was like, oh, I'm a real iconoclast. Yes. They were not like that. Um, but the word the Byzantines used, well, they used a variety of terms, but the most common is iconomachy, the, the image struggle, which is actually the battle about images. I prefer struggle because it's, Hmm. It's, it doesn't sound like a bunch of guys thugging each other out, hmm. but I actually think iconomachy is a good term, a good term for it, because it was a struggle about representation and what you can represent and what you can't. Right. Um, and another major problem beyond the terminology that we face in sort of grappling with this whole issue is that of the sources. Mm -hmm. And this happens to be, so I just finished a very long history of Byzantium beginning to end. This is by far the most problematic period when it comes to the sources. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the problems of these sources and uh, maybe give some examples of each of those different kinds of problems. I mean, I'll start with one. There are very few sources for this period, just in terms of number. And they're very difficult to get good additions of. It's another big problem. Yeah. But beyond that, but there is a very good, I'm sure you know this, but there was a really good um, re-edition of that, the church acts about iconoclasm, which has recently come out in an yes. English translation by um, Richard Price, which has got, which is, you know, it's wonderful to have for, for students. It's absolutely useful, useful. And for people watching this, it's, it's, it's got the, the basic material we have is there now in a good English translation with a commentary. But the real problem is that the sources have, the people who won, who were the pro-image side in this debate, because we haven't really said, but what this debate is about is some people thinking that you cannot have religious images and some people saying you could. And the people who say you can have religious portraits really not is what, what's the key thing, one. And therefore they destroyed the texts of the opposition. So the texts we have left are exclusively with very few, very small, very fragmentary exceptions, the texts of the victors. Now, this is true for most of you know, history before the very recent period, but it's particularly true here. What we do have is quotations from some of the anti-image people embedded in pro-image texts, but we can never be 100% sure that they haven't been mucked around with a bit. So that's one of the first problems we've got is the sources are not only few, but very heavily skewed toward the winning side. Now I, I've lost my train here. What, what else did you want me to? No, no, we, we can follow up on this. Um, so they are actually, so my advisor, Michigan, uh, John Fine, in his lectures, undergraduate lectures, he would, he would compare it in the, to the following situation. He said, suppose that for late 20th century America, the only sources you had were like, I don't know, anti-abortion writing. Like that's it. 
and like no other text other than a few scraps or you know whatever a chronicle or something like that and he said just imagine what your reconstruction of american history yeah. would look like if that's all you had right um so and that's kind of stuck with me that that image because it, it does kind of resemble that also these pro icon sources are often laid in relation to the events that they're talking about like there've been decades during which that side has had an opportunity to develop yeah, to a narrative history. Effic uh, uh, effectively they rewrote the history of the period yeah and they continue to do that well into the following century iconoclasm for those of you who don't live breathe and eat iconoclasm began sometime in the 720s, ended in the middle of the ninth century, officially 843, but the text kept being rewritten until the end of the ninth century. So we've got about 50 years mm. of after the whole thing was over of people rewriting the text, putting new little bits in to make their whoever they were writing about sound either better or worse, depending on what they wanted to do. So there's been lots of rewriting history. There's another marvelous new book that's come out recently about um, the life of Theodore Studion, who was one of the big monks mm -hmm. who was involved in the kind of the, toward the end of the, the early ninth century period, second iconoclasm as it's called. Uh, Rosemary Morris and Bill Jordan have written it. And, what, and what, one of the things they track in this in, is how the life basically uses rather abstruse uh, references to almost totally rewrite and revise the way Theodore and his monks and the monks he liked um, were always on the side of right and, and, and images and icons and all that, which wasn't, as far as we can tell, necessarily always the case. And another really, so there's a, recently in particular, there's another new book, um, which I dug out so I could also show everybody this one, you, you right. must have read this, which who traces the networks of people writing during iconoclasm and how they too worked on basically uh, making their own families look really good in the aftermath of iconoclasm. So uh, it, it's just, it, you can't trust anything you read basically about this stuff. You have to always be kind of second guessing, which is really an uncomfortable feeling because you think, well, I want it to be this way. So am I just reading this text like that because that's what I think must have happened? So you have to constantly be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. What could possibly have been going on here? Yes. And one of the narrative templates that I kept uh, coming across over and over again was the it's a recycling of the narrative of the early martyrs and the persecutions. And so no matter what was happening to the protagonists of the stories, if they were heroes, they always ended up in a confrontation with a, an oppressive emperor that resulted in some kind of martyr narrative that was sometimes lifted directly from an ancient you know, text. Um, and it's always to do with images. It's yes. never, never because there was a political insurrection and they right. were not being treasonous. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, this is Stephen the, Stephen the Younger, is yes. it, who is one of the great texts, for those of you who don't know, of the Iconoclast period. Um, his whole story has basically been, he was just really, in it. he didn't like the emperor. But his dislike of the emperor and his involvement in what appears to have been a treasonous plot is totally recast into the emperor hated icons and therefore he got killed. Yeah. So yeah, very problematic sources. There's tons of fake news in them. Uh, yep. <laughs> oh, there are, they're, they're, they're invented people and things and events. And anyway, so it is a difficult period of history to get into from that standpoint as well. And, and fun. It oh, is, yes, yes, yeah. for sure. <laughs> because you think, oh, my God, I thought we invented this stuff, but oh, no. <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah. Um, so let's now try to take a kind of linear approach to the story as you reconstructed it. Because you, you went through in like granular detail in a lot of these sources and the material culture involved here. Um, so what kinds of icons are reliably attested before this period of iconoclasm? So what, what were people doing with them and how do you classify them? In terms of panel painting icons, there are very few. And interestingly enough, they're mostly in Rome. They're yeah. not in 
in, in the Byzantine heartland at all. The ones that we have preserved are three, well, no, there are actually more than three. There are about 10 maybe on Mount Sinai that date from either before iconoclasm or during the early years of iconoclasm. There's one in, in Kiev or was in Kiev, it's now in Moscow. So. Um, so there are some actual panel paintings of, of, of saints, Peter, the Virgin, Christ, St. John. But mostly what we have is descriptions of things like that of icons rather than mm -hmm. the actual preserved things. But this isn't necessarily because they were destroyed during iconoclasm. In fact, I doubt if they were. It's that if icons are used, they get kissed all the time and things get stuck to them and eventually they get destroyed and then they're just replaced because they're basically functional mm -hmm. objects of worship. The other thing though that we also have is some, although again, not many, um, wall images, mosaics, wall paintings, and floor images. But there's not really much sense that these were ever venerated in any way at all. So there, I mean, we've got pre-iconoclastic imagery. It wasn't destroyed during iconoclasm with maybe two exceptions, but there's just not much of it left because it's old, you know, and it, it's in cities that kept being used. So the buildings got torn down and rebuilt. So it's not a big surprise. We don't have a great deal of it left. The textual evidence we have is, well, it's very interesting because there's no real evidence in the early texts, uh, very often, occasionally there is, but not very often that there was anything special about it. It was just a picture. It's a picture you walk by, there's an image of John the Baptist on the wall, great. There are a few cases where that's not true. And those are mostly in, we know about from epigrams that have been preserved, which talk about which, you know, venerating the image, but there's not very much of that. There is some, but not much. And you get the sense that there, which isn't, and it isn't a surprise, sorry to interrupt myself because that's what happened with imperial images. And that's what happened in the, in the ancient Greek world, world mm. with images of gods and goddesses. There were, people were very suspicious of that in the early Byzantine years because they didn't want to be pagan at all. But it's not really a big surprise that some element of that is going to sort of creep through and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, of course, eventually. But not for a long time. And there's not much of it. So that's basically you've got images, but nobody's paying a whole lot of attention to them most of the time until the end of the seventh century. Well, what happens then? And specifically, what do you think um, Leo III, so I also am persuaded that he didn't like ban images in the tr traditional narrative. Like, I don't think anything like that ever happened under him. And I'm not even sure what happened under his son, Constantine V, who definitely took more of an interest in the matter, especially in the later part of his reign. So two questions. What were they concerned about ultimately? And what did they actually do about it that we can reliably document? Like what was what decision did they make? Wait, who is they? Let's start with Leo the Third. Oh, okay. Leo, well, it's certainly in the 720s, people are talking about some people who they're condemning for destroying images in their own churches, bishops destroying images in their own churches. And what I think happens, and this is a long complicated and problematic in some ways argument, but of course Byzantium has just gone through a century and a half of complete catastrophe because the Arabs have overrun three quarters of their land. They've lost three quarters of the empire. So that by the, by the end, just before iconoclasm, you've got two things happening, one of which is a big rise in apocalyptic literature. I mean, they're clearly, the end of the world is happening. God is clearly unhappy with them. Something's gonna go, you know, something's gotta give. And this is, it's really at this time that you've also start getting the idea that maybe one way that people can kind of, get through to God somehow or Christ, they're not going to get through to God, but get through to a saint who can get through to God for them is through images. This is very kind of a little bit here, a little bit there, but, but it does seem to be growing and growing and growing so that by the end of the seventh century, you've got 
both the apocalyptic literature responding to the Arab in you know takeover of most of Byzantium, but also the fact that one way individual people at least can kind of get some help, you know, some kind of security is through images. That images can somehow take the place of the saint in a kind of not really being the saint, but kind of you can channel their prayers or something to to God, and that you start finding that increasingly in the, toward the end of the seventh, and then you start getting mentions of curtains covering them and candles and blah, 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 blah. So there's something is definitely going on, but to get back to Leo the third, there's no real evidence, at least at the early phases of his career that he was concerned with this at all. He was mostly concerned with keeping the Arabs out of Constantinople. Yes. I mean, he started being the ruler because he kept, he defeated the Arabs or got, got them away in 717. That's why he became emperor. The last thing on his mind was some little theological problem, except to the extent that he was a Byzantine. Byzantines, if God's mad at you, they send you curses. But God was clearly not mad at Leo the Third because he got rid of those the Arabs. I mean, and he was a hero, which is why he became emperor. So I don't think anything really happened right away there then, because what was why would he change things? But clearly some people were worried about this, presumably because, sorry, I'm really just going on here. No, 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 that's fine. Not me if I'm just going. Okay. <laughs> um, some people were upset because they're like, "What are? Why are people now praying, praying, using images as a way to access divinity?" It's interesting that they were mostly priests and bishops, because the people usually had to go through them to access God. So, in a sense, they're bypassing imperial authority. This is Peter Brown's old argument from many mm-hmm. years ago, but I think it's true. I mean, I think something is going on there, that this was a way of bypassing the official church, official authority, and people taking control of their own lives on a, on a certain level. That sounds very 21st century yeah. and very, you know, I'm empowering myself. But I actually think something like that was actually kind of happening. So Leo himself, he was doing images at the beginning of his reign. As, you know, he had, he had the virgin on his seals and he may have put up a sculptural group in front of the palace, blah, 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 blah. But he does seem to have, at least by the end of the 727, 30s, have been questioning, thinking, well, maybe there is something here. Maybe we do need to do some purification of ourselves and whatever. But we don't, he didn't, we don't know that he did anything. We have some fight back from the Pope. Yeah. But the Pope was also in a big conflict with him about land at that time. And there's some, inter- you know, yeah. it's all very, very murky and hard to tell what's going on. So yeah. is, Pope is basically appropriating imperial lands in, in Italy. So there's all kinds of problems going on there. So, you know, we don't really know if what Leo did, if anything. He is said to have taken down the image over the Halky Gate. But as marie Francois P demonstrated, I think fairly clearly, yeah. Along 1990, that article came out. That probably didn't happen. The first evidence we have of it is many, many years later in, in around 800, 810, 87. So, yes. So, so the, the reign of Leo III is pretty murky in this regard. Um, and there are a lot of things going on. And, and as you said, the later sources find it convenient sometimes to convert yeah. those other things that are going on yeah. into conflicts about icons. Mm. Yeah. And Leo's son, yes. Constantine V, really was anti-icons and wrote all kinds of theological treatises about it and all that. And so as somebody went, put to me, well, I said, of course, they're going to hate Leo III. He was a father of Constantine V. What do you expect? <laughs> the sins of the sons fall onto the fathers, this kind yeah. of thing. Sort of. So, um, yeah, so, but we just don't know. We just don't know. So both of those emperors, Leo III, Constantine V, were, we have to say, very successful emperors um, at doing the sorts of things that emperors were expected to do um, in terms of you know, military and even economic policy. They seem to have been uh, you know, reformers and successful. And Constantine V even took the fight to the Arabs, to the Bulgars. Okay. Constantine V uh, is my hero. Oh, really? I love Constantine. I mean, I probably wouldn't if I knew him, but I just think he's amazing. He was a great builder. He did. I mean, he didn't rebuild High High Irene, which everybody used to think he did. He didn't. But he was just great. I mean, he did all kinds of great stuff. He brought water back to Constantinople, for heaven's sake. 
He killed the dragon in the aqueduct. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, of what? course, he, of course, he did. <laughs> he did. He did. There's a whole story yeah. about. It. Um, I I know the story well. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. okay. So, what was his problem with icons? So, by the time that he was articulating positions on the issue, what at least ostensibly is his theological objection to using icons in worship? Ah, just to roll back a tiny bit. Okay. Before Constantine V, people had done the standard icons are idols number. Constantine V was much more sophisticated than that and basically dropped that argument because there are plenty of arguments against that. Like God, yeah, well, I'm not even going to rehearse those. But what Constantine said was that an image of Christ can only represent his human side. And therefore it's separating away his divine side and that is heresy. That was his key main point. So the only way you can actually have an image of Christ is to do what Christ said was his own image, which was take this bread, this is my body, take this mm -hmm. one, this is my blood and so he, got, he said the eucharist the, the communion the bread and the wine of communion is the only real image of christ that in in a nutshell is what yes. Constantine's position was i always thought that was a very clever argument it is a very clever yes. argument. and you know in the modern theological literature it just tends to be dismissed or hand waved as well clearly these are the ravings of someone who doesn't understand the theology no i think it was pretty brilliant actually. Yes. <laughs> however yes. there is a good response to it okay let's hear it <laughs> the response to that is jesus christ came to earth in the flesh god's will god said he should god yes. did it he's there he's god on the earth we could see him if you say you can't depict him, you are denying the incarnation. And yes. boy, that is an even worse heresy. Yep. So take that, Constantine V is basically what they said. You know, these are both great arguments. Yes. And, the, and both sides said tradition is on our side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tradition is on our side. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. So th that's the core of it. The, the secondary argument underpinning all this is that the anti-image people, understandably enough, were thought the word was the only only way you could really get to God and to Christian truth was through scripture and through words, whereas the image people basically equated word and image images were just as good as getting truth to you as words, but kind of aired kind of not aired is not the right word kind of lent on the side of sight we get all very aristotelian argumentation mm -hmm. here which we won't go into please um, <laughs> but, but it really does get into a yeah. kind of a is it the word is it sight and since like 90 percent of byzantium was illiterate this was basically saying the church is going to rule your lives kids yes um, and that's not going to really gonna work in the long run is it Yes, they're very good arguments. Unless you're in South America in the 1800s, but anyway. <laughs> um, Constantine V really, um, you know, yanked their chain. I mean, I, to a certain degree, I think he was also kind of trolling the opposition here. Um, and, and he did it very successfully. And that's why they said such horrible things about him. Um, you know, the level of abuse is usually proportionate to how much someone has actually cut to the chase of what you know, matters to you. Um, but anyway, let's turn from the theological arguments to the material culture. So do we have, you know, hard, concrete material evidence for the destruction of icons in the eighth century? Like, what does that look like? No. There are two instances that we can document of any kind of destruction at all that are not part of... I mean, there could have been more, but there are two things we can see. One is the images in the upper, uh, an upper room in the great church of Constantinople, Hagia Sophia, the great church, in a private room that led from the patriarchal palace to the church itself, to the upper gallery. It's now used as an archive and nobody's allowed into it. So nobody's seen it for years. But um, it that was being refurbished 
in the 760s. So well into all of this, the big Constantine V um, church council that banned images, the, the only one that did was in 754. So this was 15 years, 12 to 15 years after that. There were images of, of saints, medallions of saints about, well, probably this slightly larger than life size. Well, yeah, probably slightly larger than life size. And their names were underneath them. And their the faces were picked out quite carefully and replaced with a cross. And the names were picked out and just replaced with tesserae. So that happened in the 760s. The other thing that appears to have happened is a church that was destroyed in, in the uh, unrest between Turkey and Greece in the 1920s in Nicaea, where the apse mosaic, so all we have is photographs now, where the apse mosaic apparently originally had a virgin and child in it, which was replaced with a cross. It was then later again replaced with the virgin and child again. But as far, those are the only two document, documented cases of destruction we have, and we don't know when that one was. Yeah, the ones in Hagia Sophia really blew my mind because it means that for over a decade after the ecclesiastical council that Constantine V convened to condemn the use of icons in worship, they just stayed there in Hagia Sophia, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like his patriarchs were like his own, his yes men, a lot of them, like they, if they didn't follow his policy, they were usually deposed. And those images just stayed no, there. No, not, not usually. Always, always, <laughs> yeah, anyway. uh, or quit, or quit, yeah, under, um, under some prodding, I would have administrative disagreements. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's a, I, I had a, a former dean used to refer to them that way. Anyway, <laughs> um, and and yet those images stayed there for over a decade until they were planning to, I don't know, renovate the room or do something to it. Yeah. And but it's a. I, I try to wrap my mind around how those images stayed there under those circumstances. Like, is that because that was just like a conference room that wasn't used for worship? Like they weren't problematic in terms of veneration or something like that? Like they couldn't have just forgotten them. No, no, no. I think it's just as long as nobody's doing anything with them, you know, it's, they're just images. Right. They're not, we, you know, we live in a very, very visual age. So did the Byzantines, but it's different. And I just, they were just there. I mean, in, by the time of um, second iconoclasm, people are saying, well, we're going to leave the images that are high up because who cares? Because nobody can kiss them, basically. So it's, I just, I think we're guilty in the modern world of kind of giving a little bit more importance to images sometimes than the Byzantines did. Not that they didn't think they were important, but they're, an image in one place means something different from an image in a different place. And these yeah. were images, I'm not sure, it was, well, nobody knows what the room was really used for. It probably was a conference room, as you say, but, you know, but it was also only used by members of the elite. Right. So, you know, a lot of this is, well, we know what to, you know, a lot of this is a bit snobby. Mm. And I'm also reminded of a letter that Michael II, this is a- Yeah, that's the nice... one about, we're going to leave the things up on the walls because- Yes, yeah. um, where he's sending a letter to a uh, Frankish king in the West explaining what, you know, is going on with iconoclasm because he was nominally an iconoclast. So I don't think he particularly cared about it at all. Um, and his wording is something like, well, there were these images that were, I mean, I, I'm just going to explain what I think he's saying that were like in the line of sight when you're praying in the church. And like, those are the ones that are problematic. Like if they're off to the side or very high up or whatever, like they're not so much a problem. Yeah, and those which, were just covered up. They weren't destroyed. They were covered up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a completely different understanding than the traditional iconoclast narrative. Yeah. And so, yeah. Which is very, very colored by the Reformation. Yes. That's so, and it's just, it's yeah. a very, very different phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yeah, things that happened in England and in, in yeah. the 16th century and so forth. Yeah. So why did Irene Irini overturn this policy? Like she, she made this like a signature issue of hers, like she's going to overturn it. And she did in, in 787. W what was she going on about? Like, I mean, what, what, what sparked that? I have no idea. 
and and the, what's really interesting about it, I wonder, frankly, if Tarasios, who was her patriarch, wasn't actually the person who was pushing this one, because he had um, issues, <laughs> with, as far as we can tell. Again, it's very hard to know what's going on, but he certainly did have issues with some of the other church authorities who were, were iconoclasts. But the other thing that could be going on, and this is in fact what I think we ended up arguing in the book because we could never quite figure out what we actually, anything better, was that Irene was trying quite hard at that point to reestablish good relations with the Pope, who was pro-image, not in the Byzantine way because the West never was. Um, never worshipped through images the way the way that Byzantine ultimately did, but there's a lot of less. Can we just calm everything down now, for heaven's sakes, and just kind of get on with doing what we need to do, which is protect our borders? Uh, that's the best I because there is no indication Irene would never have been allowed to marry her husband. Her, her, hus her husband if she'd been an iconophile mm -hmm. if she'd been a very strong pro-image person that just would not have happened it could not have happened so there's no indication that she was pro-images in the in, before then and any or the uh, commission she and her son Constant VI um uh may did and th that are preserved are not figural there's Thessaloniki, which is cross against the starry sky. So she's not associated yeah. particularly with any great flourishing of figural representation. Although there is some during second during her the interim period between the two iconic clubs, but, but it's not associated with her. So I, I suspect it is either that it's a more political decision than a um theological well she also wanted peace in the church i mean that's yeah. going to be a lot and she was very very good to monks she gave a lot of money to the monastic cause which is why she got very good press afterwards from the monks i mean i don't know if you've ever done this but if you track the the history um theophanies history which was written he theophanies the confessor who wrote one of the great histories of byzantine world what knew irene and calls her pious more than any other emperor or empress in the entire book. I mean, yeah. she's the pious one, always pious, pious. I think the only one that even comes close to her is Constantine the Great, the first. Yeah. So, I mean, he's really, he, she got him on side, man, really right away by giving, you know, a lot of money to the monks, basically. Yes. So, she appointed, so uh, yeah, she appointed Theodore to the Monastery of Studius. Yeah. Yes, uh, there's a lot of favor ga gathering there. Um, yes. So she's trying to calm things down because she's in a very weak position. She's a female empress. This is the only one we've got until much later, 200 years later. So yes. So she's in a tricky slot. So uh, it's traditionally been, you know, found curious that the two phases of iconoclasm have this kind of structural similarity to them in the sense that. You have some military emperors who are kind of against icons and their policies are overturned by a woman, uh, Irene in the first case, uh, Theodora in the second, who is someone who's married into the previously iconoclastic um, imperial family. And these women are acting um, you know, on behalf of their um, underage sons or Sort of <laughs> not in Irene's time. case, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's like, it's a remarkable coincidence that it plays out that way in both cases. And so both of these empresses had to develop, or they had developed for them, narratives that they were secretly iconophilic yeah. Yeah. all along and were just waiting for the opportunity to jump in and reverse these policies. When that's that, just as you said, that's almost certainly not the case, and they, I think, they made that decision to restore icons based on like very specific political circumstances that they yeah. were in in those years, right? Yeah. Um, and and the apparatus that they deployed to to restore the icons were 
like usually just officials of the previous regime. Like it, it, it isn't like they overhauled everything uh, from one day to the next. Um, but I also found it very difficult to uh, explain exactly what those circumstances were that urged them to do that, right? Like it, it, in Irene's case, for sure, like I think what, what, what you said is right, that they they wanted to restore better relations with the papacy, but also with like some of the Eastern churches like Jerusalem and so on, yeah. Yeah. that had also not bought into the anti-icon policy. And that by restoring those relations, that boosts her standing, right, as an Orthodox mm -hmm. monarch and so forth. But it's, anyway, the sources are really terrible for all that. Yes, they are. <laughs> Especially because in both cases, you've got the whole overlay of gender rhetoric. Yes. So it, it just makes it even that much murkier to try to figure out what's actually going on. Let's so. talk about that a little bit. So how does a gender rhetoric play out in these cases? Well, in Irene's case is, you know, her, despite her weakness as a woman and blah, 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 you know, it's all, she's terrible because of that. The people that didn't like her, this is not Theophanes, who does twice criticize her. In both cases, it's because of her weakness as a woman. But mostly he's very, very pro Irene and all that. But of course, other, other sources of the period do criticize her because she's a woman and she shouldn't be ruling and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Theodora, this is the wife of the last of the iconoclast emperors, Theophilus, whose son, Michael III, was on the throne with her. He was very young at the time. He was basically a toddler still um, when the triumph of orthodoxy happened in 843. Basically gets written out of history. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, there's her saint's life, which is kind of like, Oh, really? <laughs> but, but it's all about trying to protect her husband, all these things wives are supposed to do, mm -hmm. and her son. And so it's, it's, who knows what she was really doing? Yeah. It's very, very hard. And it's later, the text is later too. Mark Apples has some good stuff. Um, so we just don't know. So is it my imagination? Or was there an element of like, female hero women heroes of you know the pro icon side kind of written into a lot of these stories like i just get the sense that the iconophiles like to present women as being the champions of the icons well, yeah because they are the I iconic weak you know who are championing the, you know it's wonderful marie Francoise p in her um stuff about the life of Stephen the Younger, which is the seminal text for this whole period, has a wonderful series of stuff on um, how women are used in the, in the life of Stephen the Younger. And they're always there to kind of bolster things and they're always protecting the men and the, the pro image men, obviously. And another, there's another book um, by Irene Panu about the cult of St. Anne, where she talks about how Anne too becomes much, much more venerated and, and rises up in status during precisely this period. So the cult of St. Anne also comes into, into prominence in this period. And I have always wondered, although I would never publish this, I don't think, if it's it's the mother son relationship, which is very big with Christ and Mary, at this mm. period, because of course it's because of Mary that we've got the incarnate Christ, and that's why she's represented in the first yeah. big new decoration program that goes up in Hagia Sophia, the great church after iconoclasm. And I wonder if there's something about the mother son relationship that maybe not even consciously is kind of playing itself out in a lot of the a lot of the narratives but it, that would be impossible to prove i think but it's it's interesting yeah because but particularly because of the cult of saint anne the virgin's mother also coming up in, in this period interesting yeah um yeah. so we're almost out of time but i was wondering if at the end you wanted to leave us with some final thoughts about like the significance of byzantine iconoclasm in light of all of this uh, work that, I mean, fairly, I think we can call it revisionist that you and many others have done. We, we're now in a very, very different place than we were a generation before. Um, so any takeaways for what the significance of Byzantine iconoclasm should be now? Because it used to be brought up in some pretty big like meta narratives, like by the, sometimes it was a precursor of, you know, pr the Protestant Reformation and you know, or, or all of these kinds of big picture um, ideas. 
Uh, what are we left with now? It seems like a somewhat downsized controversy. Yeah, it's downsized. The controversy is downsized, but the result wasn't. I mean, it's basically because of iconoclasm, we now have image theory and it informs the whole of Orthodox Christianity. Right. I mean, that is basically there now. And if, if, if they hadn't opposed icons, we wouldn't have that. Right. You didn't have the thing that you have to go in and kiss a rope, that have to go in and kiss the icon, worship it. So it essentially made Orthodox Christianity the way it is today, which in an ideal world, which of course we don't live in, would mean that people were in charge, had agency over their own relationship with God, which is pretty important, I think. And they don't have to go through priests. And you know. That's, yeah. That's a big thing. <laughs> that's a big deal. Yeah, you, so I you, think that's that's very different from the Reformation. You put that very nicely in one of your books where you say that it was, a, it was <laughs> iconoclasm that created yeah. the whole culture of the veneration of icons and the theory that supported it, not the other way around. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the all the icon theorists like Theodore of Studius and others, like <coughs> um, they believe that they were like explaining an age old practice that went back to the first days, whereas in fact, they were kind of inventing it and codifying it for the first time. Um, and I think that's right, yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what I, so this is an experience that I had though, of course I don't remember it as you will see. So my mother's American and she moved to Greece in the sixties. And when I was born um, for a while, <coughs> she was still working. And she hired a nanny that they knew somehow through my, my father's Greek family. And at some point, my mother realized that this woman would take me, sort of a bundled infant, just an infant, to the church and would sort of hold me like a battering ram and press my face up against one of the icons. <laughs> <laughs> and was doing this like a couple times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. Set no. you We're up not... for life, didn't it? Absolutely <laughs> set you up for life. <laughs> right. So, so my mom quickly put an end to that. Um, <laughs> but here I am, you know, Byzantinist. <laughs> talking about icons. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Leslie, thank you so much uh, for your work, which I found very inspiring and very helpful to, as, as a guide to get through all of these problems. Cause I really needed one. There are periods of Byzantine history that lack the kind of work that you've done and I, where I just feel like I'm alone in the wilderness, but anyway, you've done great work. Thank you for that. And for coming onto the podcast. Thank you. And nice to see you. It's been a while. Yes. Too long. Um, I'll be over there at some point soon. Good. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs>